In some of the Apostle Paul's final writings, you find that in 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and uh, briefly in the book of Titus, he warns the church and the believer that in the latter days men shall depart from the faith. Now here he's not talking about uh, Madeline Murray O'Hare or uh, Saddam Hussein. Uh, these are men that and women that have never been in the faith. He's talking about false teachers who profess perhaps to be religious but do not possess Jesus who have a form of godliness but deny the power thereof. Apostasy, the falling away from the faith. There is one book in the Bible totally given over to the coming great and final apostasy, and that is the book of Jude. And we're looking at this in sixfold fashion. The problem of apostasy, the description of apostasy, historical examples and causes of apostasy, the metaphors of apostasy, the judgment upon apostasy, and especially number six, and this is very important to us today, the safeguards against apostasy. I do not believe that a child of God can become an apostate. I think once saved, always saved. However, I definitely strongly believe that a child of God can be adversely affected by apostasy. I've known Christians that have been tied in knots by listening to Jehovah Witnesses who are apostates, and uh, they, of course, did not become apostate, but they were affected by apostasy or perhaps people attending, born-again people attending liberal churches where the pastor denies the book Blood and Blessed Hope. They do not deny those things, but they be, their faith becomes weakened by apostasy. Here's our introduction. Jude, the arrogant apostate described and denounced. Such is the message of the book of Jude. Jude was the brother of James, author of the book of James, and the first pastor of the Jerusalem church, and half-brother of Jesus. We say half-brother because they had the same mother but different fathers. Along with his brothers, his full brothers and sisters, Jude did not believe in the ministry of Jesus until after the resurrection. In John 7, it said, Neither did his brethren, speaking of Jesus, believe on him. But sometime between the resurrection and ascension, both men... Jude and James were gloriously saved. I think probably Jesus appeared to James, and maybe James then had the privilege of leading his brother Jude to the Savior, their elder, disowned half-brother. Both Jude and James were present along with their mother Mary in the upper room just prior to Pentecost. Jude was apparently married and was accompanied by his wife as he performed missionary work. Paul seems to teach this in 1 Corinthians 9. The beginning, and I have uh, several quotations now from uh, a book called Jude, the Acts of the Apostates, authored by Dr. S. Maxwell Coder, who for many years was dean of education and the faculty at Moody Bible Institute. He's written the best overview, I think, of the book of Jude that I've seen. He said, the beginning of the age of the church is described in the Acts of the Apostles. The end of the church age is set forth in the epistle of Jude, which might be well called the Acts of the Apostates. Jude is the only book in all God's Word entirely devoted to the great apostasy which is to come upon Christendom before the Lord Jesus Christ returns. This brief message of 25 verses is the vestibule to the Revelation, the book of Revelation. Without Jude, the prophetic picture which begins with the teachings of Christ in the Gospels and developed throughout the epistles would be incomplete. Jude brings the teachings of the entire Bible about apostasy to a tremendous, if not fearful, uh, climax. He takes us back to the very dawn of human history. We are reminded of apostasy at the gate of Eden and within God's ancient people, Israel. 
Our thoughts are turned to princes and prophets, to saints and sinners, to eternal fire and everlasting darkness, to the sea and to the stars, to past judgments and future glory. <laughs> they don't write descriptions of Bible books like that anymore. A Jude can be compared to Second Peter. Both epistles give the marks of false teachers. Uh, Peter placed the ministry of false teachers in the future, whereas Jude saw them as already present. Now, probably wasn't over uh, two, maybe 10, 15, 20 years between Jude and Peter, and so it had a fast beginning apostasy. Both epistles refer to fallen angels. Both mention Sodom and Gomorrah. Both use Balaam as an example of apostasy. Both liken apostasy to wander waterless clouds. Uh, Jude has been called the judges of the New Testament. And he refers to two non-canonical books, The Assumption of Moses and the Book of Enoch. And we will uh, talk about especially the Book of Enoch later on. And again, J. Vernon McGee has said this, Jude was intending to write an epistle regarding our common salvation when the Spirit detoured him to write concerning the apostasy. He says, it is a graphic and striking description of the apostasy. What was a little cloud the size of a man's hand in Jude's day is in our day a storm of hurricane proportions because we are in the apostasy of which he foretold. It is a question now of how much worse it can b become before genuine believers are taken out by the rapture. Uh, McGee wrote those words about probably uh, 30, 40 years ago, and uh, my how things have changed for the worse. It is the Jude, the, wor the first of two New Testament books referring to Michael the archangel, both deal with his encounter with Satan. The book of Jude is the only New Testament book to provide for us a sample of the kind of preaching pre-flood sinners once heard. We're going to look at a little later on uh, what uh, was heard at the uh, east of Eden pre-flood preaching crusade. Uh, Jude concludes his epistle with one of the New Testament greatest doxologies. All right, now we look at our outline, the six-fold outline, the problem of apostasy. And Jude begins with this commendation, Jude, the servant of the Lord Jesus Christ and brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved, not pickled now, preserved in Jesus Christ and called, mercy unto you and peace and love be multiplied. That's his commendation, his opening words, but now his compulsion. Beloved, when I gave diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort that you should earnestly contend for the faith, which was once, in the Greek, for all delivered unto the saints. Now, Jude might have thought, well, you know, God is calling me to write something about the Christian faith. And, uh, you know, uh, there are four men that have done this, the life of Christ, uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But I probably could uh, do as good a job, maybe a little better. I'd have more details because unlike those men, I grew up in the same home that the Savior grew up in. And as he sat down the Spirit of God to write, the Spirit of God says, no, I want you to write not about the Messiah, I want you to write about the coming apostasy. So you have his commendation, his compulsion, his concern. For there are certain men crept in unawares. And the word unawares is literally having settled down alongside. They're sneaky. They just they don't come in like a like a a loud uh, bang, as it were, but uh, very, a very soft approach. And before you know it, they have infiltrated the church, entire denominations, etc. Then that's the problem of apostasy, the description of apostasy. In no less than 14 terse and terrible terms, Jude describes the filthy fruit 
of an apostasy. Before listing these, however, let me define what an apostate really is. And we turn to Dr. Coder again. He said an apostate is one who has received light, L-I-G-H-T, but not L-I-F-E. He may have received in some degree the written word, but he has not received the living word, the Son of God. So he might know something about God but he knows nothing experientially about the saving power of God. He may know something about the Word, as a liberal would get perhaps a preacher in a seminary, the Word of God, but he knows nothing about the God of the Word. He has experienced light, but not life. And here are the 14 terrible terms. Apostates are ungodly, twisters of God's grace, Christ deniers, sensuous, flesh defilers, despisers of authority, ignorant critics, unreasoning animals, immoral fault finders, arrogant to the core, lying flatterers for personal gain, divisive, worldly minded, and the last is perhaps the most frightening, devoid, absolutely empty of the spirit, dead men walking around. Number three in our outline, historical examples and causes of apostasy. And uh, we have a number here, the nation Israel caused by unbelief. Not that all the people in that Exodus march that died in the wilderness were apostates, but they were influenced perhaps no doubt, by the mixed multitude of unsaved Egyptians that followed them, and they were influenced by apostasy. Apostate, apostasy. Uh, and Jude says, I will therefore put you in remembrance, though you once knew this, you've probably forgotten, that how the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believed not. Now, it didn't mean that uh, every mom and dad and brother and sister who died in the wilderness uh, split hell wide open. Uh, some did, but uh, those that were covered by the blood of the Lamb before they left the land of Egypt, I think, were saved. But they, were, they, they, they did not cross over as God wanted them to and possess their possessions. Vance Havner used to say they we sing uh, standing on the promises of God but we're sitting on the premises of God. So he uses the entire nation and then the fallen angels caused by disloyalty. Uh, these uh, angels led by Lucifer and they entered into this foul revolt against the Lord Jesus. Another Example here, the citizens of Sodom and Gomorrah caused by sexual perversion. Now, that's why we speak out against homosexuality and the gay life, etc., because for some reason, God detests this sin perhaps more than murder or cannibalism. I suppose the worst two sins, of course, are pride and, and self-will. But uh, sexual perversion just goes against the grain of God. And uh, the, 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 the terrible thing, the, the, the fruits of this is that it leads to apostasy, not just immorality, but apostasy as seen by the citizens of Sodom and Gomorrah. And then he uh, uses the devil himself as an apostate, the original apostate. Of course, the cause there was his pride and self-will. Now, I have a passage here. I won't have a chance probably to talk too much about it. But it's, uh, it's one of the most controversial uh, books, uh, uh, verses in the Bible. It's Jude chapter 9. Yet Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses, durst not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke thee. Now, in this passage, Satan is indirectly brought in as an apostate. Uh, the question, though, has been asked, Why did Satan desire Moses' body? 
the assumption of Moses, which is not a scriptural book, but it may give us some reasons here, gives two reasons why Moses should not have had a decent burial. Uh, because Moses had formerly murdered an Egyptian, Satan may have been arguing that, or because he, Satan, was the king of death and had the right to all dead bodies, or because Satan, and I think probably these two here, the last two are reasons why Satan was trying to uh, conscript the dead body of Moses. Because Satan wanted the body to be found by Israel and worshipped as a sacred relic. And then you'd have the first church of Moses today. And because Satan desired to keep Moses from appearing with Elijah on the Mount of Transfiguration. Uh, that may or may not have been the case. I don't think uh, Satan certainly would have known what was going to happen 14 centuries later. But, but at any rate, I think the key reason, he wanted the body to be found that it might be worshipped as they worship the brazen a serpent, and uh, to the extent that uh, Hezekiah had finally had to destroy it here. All right, uh, and then he also, as an example, uses Cain caused by religious perversion. Woe be unto them, false teachers, apostates. They have gone in the way of Cain. And the way of Cain is described in Genesis 4, and here is his way. He brought a bloodless sacrifice to God. And this is the way of the apostate liberals of our day. They look to culture instead of Calvary. Uh, the th theme, uh, the doctrine that separates the men from the boys, theologically speaking, is not just what think ye of the Bible, that's extremely important, or what think ye of heaven and hell, but what think ye of the blood of Christ? And if you ask someone that and they hiccup one time, then we know that they have been influenced by apostasy, bringing a bloodless sacrifice uh, trying to please God. And then he uses Balaam, the Old Testament prophet, uh, his apostasy was caused by greed for money. Balaam was a money-grabbing false prophet mentioned in Numbers 22 to 25. The heir of Balaam was of making merchandise of the gospel ministry. Did you ever hear of a preacher doing that? Well, just about every day, I guess. Balaam was actually the best profit that money could buy, literally. All right, and then he talks about Korah, his final illustration, example, caused by rejection of divine authority. Now, in number 16, Korah led a rebellion against Moses, the official spokesman for God. For this great sin, he was sent down into the pit, the earth opening up its bowels and swallowing him. And present-day apostates, they speak evil against pastors, uh, that is to say godly pastors, and missionaries, Bible teachers, and other God-appointed men. Dr. Coder uh, summarizes by this passage by saying, Cain was a tiller of the soil, Balaam was a prophet, Korah was a prince in I Israel. One reason for this selection of the three men may be to demonstrate that apostasy is not confined to one class of person. This evil is not peculiar to religious leaders. It touches prophets, priests, and people alike. There are apostates in the pulpit, the palace, and the poorhouse. I like that. The metaphors of apostasy. Continuing on with Coder's statements, I said it's the best, uh, you know, use the best, the best I've seen, the book. The more minutely we examine this great epistle, Jude, the more impressive becomes its delineation of the doctrine of apostasy. Jude has now covered the whole creation, from angels to men and brute beasts. There yet remains the realm of nature, and in five flashing inspired word pictures, he brings before us the earth, the air, the trees, the sea, and the starry heavens to complete the panorama needed to provide the church with a magnificent 
chilling, I might add, final summary of conditions as they are to be in Christendom just before the scenes of Revelation are unveiled. And here are these uh, five flashing inspired word pictures. Hidden rocks. An apostate is like a hidden rock. These men are those who are hidden reefs in your love feasts. Apparently, in that time, they were uh, infiltrating the, the communion, the Lord's Supper. When they feast with you without fear, caring for themselves. And hidden rocks, this describes the unseen dangers of apostasy. And uh, you know how many ships have been lost, not through storms, or springing a leak, as it were, or colliding with another ship, but running into a hidden rock. A second metaphor, waterless clouds. Clouds are they without water, carried about of winds, and this describes the false claims of apostasy. I remember uh, a false uh, preacher in... in uh, Chicago, Illinois, and I heard him uh, preach uh, this sermon on the radio. He said he gave a, it was, I don't even remember what he preached on, but I remember his invitation. And I thought he was going to give a Billy Graham uh, invitation. He said, you out there, you're listening to me, and uh, you're in a great sorrow, etc., and, and you're about ready to do yourself in, and, and nobody believes in you, and, and on and on. And he said, I have an answer. And I thought, that's great, that's great. This guy's not so liberal after all. He said, here is my answer to your problem. Go fishing. <laughs> well, <laughs> he's an apostate, you see. He promises so much. Another time he said, I have an answer to your problem. He said, you're at the end of your rope. Tie a knot and hang on. That's an apostate who promises much, delivers nothing. And then he describes them as dead autumn trees. Autumn trees without fruit, doubly dead, uprooted. And this describes the wasted efforts of apostasy. And finally, wandering stars, perhaps the most uh, fearful description of an apostate. Verse 13, wandering stars to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. And this describes the aimless purpose of of apostasy. And number five, the judgment upon apostasy. Uh, you have the messenger and the message here. The messenger and Enoch, also the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these saying, and here is a type of preaching that you would have heard before the flood. Uh, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousand of his saints to execute judgment upon all and convince all that are ungodly. Notice how many times he uses this, referring to apostates in the days of Noah. Among them of all their ungodly deeds, which they have ungodly committed. And of all their hard speeches, which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Not only him, but the God, but the God that he served. Uh, which would have been uh, Noah. And so uh, you have uh, Jude preaching this. Now, I mean, Enoch preaching this. Uh, what, a, what a man of faith he must have been because he preached about the second coming of the, the Messiah to judge apostates centuries before the first coming took place. Finally, number six, the safeguards against apostasy. The believer is to build on the Word of God. He is to pray with the Spirit of God. He is to keep in the love of God. And uh, the believer and the lost, uh, concerning those in great doubt, have mercy upon some who are doubting. Concerning those who are in great danger, save others, snatching them out of the fire. And concerning them who are in great depravity, and on some have mercy, with fear, hating even the garment polluted by the flesh. And then his grand and glorious doxology. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of your glory with exceeding joy to the only wise God, our Savior. I was thinking of a song to end this, and I think Robert Robinson's a great song. Wonderful words, but it has a sad story there. I'll read the first and then the last stanza. Come thou fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing, call 
called for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious sonnet sung by flaming tongues above. Praise the mount I'm fixed upon it, mount of thy redeeming love. What's wrong with that? Well, nothing but the last stanza gives us a sad note here. Oh, he said to grace, how great a debtor. Daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy goodness like a fetter bind my wandering heart to thee. Now notice this. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, O oh, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. And this was written, well, he died in 1790, probably written about uh, 20 years before his death. And uh, a year before his death, he confessed that uh, he did not have the joy of the Lord, that he had forsaken God, and he trusted that God had not forsaken him. A glorious song, but the Bible says, uh, make sure of your salvation. And I think uh, the answer, he answered it himself. He just didn't, uh, uh, you know, obey his own uh, right. He, he didn't read his own writings here. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. And that's what we do today. Prone to leave the God we love. But here's our heart. Oh, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. Lord, I know I'll never be an apostate. I'm saved, once saved, always saved. Keep me, though, from wandering because of apostasy.